I'm Nicolene Peck and I teach all over the world about parenting, good communication, how to build strong family bonds, child development, education, all through the lens of the principle self-government. And in this video, we're talking about principles of the United States Constitution and self-government. <laughs> video we're going to be talking about some of the basic principles of the United States Constitution and what the Constitution says about self-government and how understanding self-government can help us better understand freedom. Normally on this channel, I end up talking about relationships, behaviors, how to help children, learn things like disagreeing appropriately, accepting no answers, accepting consequences, how to help family bonds, roles in the family, and how to help parents maintain calmness, those types of things. So why in the world am I doing a video all about government? Well, I do participate a lot in government. In fact, right now I'm running for political office in my state, but also for many years I have worked with state governments, national governments in the United States of America, as well as in other nations around the world through different forums, congresses, as well as working at the United Nations to try to help protect faith, family, and freedom at the United Nations and trying to help governments that I work with in that sphere be able to work better to protect freedom in their nations. So it is something that I am very passionate about. In fact, as I am looking ahead right now in my candidacy that I'm running for office for house in my state, I do see that understanding self-government is a key piece to understanding the principles of freedom in the United States and in the Constitution. And since I have spent well over 25 years of my life now teaching all about self-government as it relates to the individual, I thought that it was about time that I talk about self-government and how that relates to government. So first let's talk about the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution is a powerful and very unique document. So I really value the United States Constitution. In fact, the United States Constitution actually laid a foundation for many of the other constitutions in nation states around the world. The United States Constitution did something that no other constitution did prior to that time. In fact, it preserved the freedoms and the liberties of the people in a very, very unique way. So one thing the United States Constitution did was it preserved popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty means that the people decide who is going to represent them. So the United States is supposed to be a representative republic. I know a lot of people say that the United States is a democracy. And while democracy and being a democratic republic is part of the United States, we actually are supposed to be a representative republic, which means that we really value this idea that we get to choose. As citizens of the United States, we get to decide who gets to be in power, who gets to represent us. We get to have an ongoing dialogue with that person. Those people are supposed to be accessible. I know that when I look for people who I want to elect to political office, I want to know that I can call them on the phone or text them or go and meet them somewhere and talk to them and express my concerns, maybe even offer some of my suggestions. So popular sovereignty is a big part and an important principle of the United States Constitution. We just talked about one vital principle in the Constitution. There's more to come. But before I get into these other principles in the Constitution and how they relate to self-government, what we need to know about self-government, do you participate? in your government, wherever you happen to live? Do you contact your representatives and talk to them? And if so, what types of things do you talk to them about? Leave me a comment below. 
Limited government is another principle in the United States Constitution. The Constitution basically gives the power to the people, right? We the people is how the beginning starts of the Constitution. So the people get to choose who is going to represent them, but also they get to choose how much power that representative is going to have. The people put into authority in different political offices are actually given power or no power based upon what the people decide. Another principle in the United States Constitution is separation of powers. So there are three branches of government in the federal government. Also, there's three branches of government in every state. Those three branches of government are the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch. And there is supposed to be division of powers among those branches. This makes it so that no one branch of government can take over the government. This is very important. So having an organizational structure is a big deal. This provides checks and balances. This makes it so that if there is one branch of government that is getting too powerful, taking over too much, that those other branches of government can provide balance or even rein that other branch of government in. The judicial branch is in charge of governing over how the laws are being executed. The legislative branch helps create the laws and the executive branch actually governs over certain things in the country. There are many principles in the United States Constitution, but I think the last one that I'm going to mention here that I feel like we really need to remember in our society nowadays is federalism. Federalism basically means that the federal government is over the states, but the states are over the counties and the counties are over the cities and the cities are over the entities in the cities like the police and those types of things. And then the people are over themselves. So in federalism, each person maintains their own sovereignty and each city, its own sovereignty, it's each county and state its own sovereignty. So not only is our nation not controlled by the United Nations or others, but each individual city should not be controlled or coerced by the federal government. There is a line of authority, a chain of command as it were, and that helps maintain the rights of the states, the rights of the cities, the rights of the people. And the federalism principle is something that I adamantly cherish. So what about self-government? What does the Constitution say about self-government? Well, it starts out, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, right? We know that preamble of the Constitution. It, but it says that we the people do all of those things. So it doesn't actually say in the Constitution that there are certain things that are supposed to be self-governed. The entire beginning of the Constitution establishes that it is the individual that maintains the primary rights. In fact, the Bill of Rights in the Constitution that actually provides for freedom of religion and the press and speech and all of those wonderful things, the right to bear arms, those things are pointed back toward the citizen as having the power and the right. So that is self-government in relation to the Constitution. Now, the founders of the Constitution wrote many things related to self-government. In fact, they declared that they were creating a self-governing nation. So what that meant was that they put the power back on the people. So what happens then if the people stop governing themselves? What if they start looking to their nation to solve all of their problems and to control them. Well, actually, they start ruining the whole pattern of self-government and make it so that they are not 
being a trustworthy steward of their nation. If the people do not put trust in themselves and in the people to control what happens in the nation, then what occurs is they start putting their trust in the elected officials full trust in the elected officials and they stop participating. If they stop voting, stop voicing their opinions, stop having freedom in the press and freedom of speech, and they don't stand up for those things, stop having arms and the right to bear arms. If they stop using those freedoms that they are given because of the divinely inspired document, the constitution of the United States, then they lose their self-government. But not just that, the nation loses its self-government. The people are the key to the freedom and the liberty of the nation, not the elected officials. And even though right now I'm running for political office, I would hope that if I ever do anything that people don't like, if I vote for something that they don't agree with, that they would elect me out, that they would put up somebody else to challenge me. But I would hope that they would never complain to their neighbors about what's going on and never participate, never vote for me or not for me or any other elected official. If you don't vote and you don't call them and you don't send an email and you don't go on the news and voice your opinion, if you don't do any of those things and be heard, but you just complain or lose faith in the system, then the system is already lost. The percentage of people that don't vote in the United States of America is actually deplorable. Everyone complains, but there are a whole bunch of people that don't vote. There are people in other countries that are still giving their lives to be able to have an opinion, to have a voice, to be able to vote. Yet in our country where we have had that right and privilege for a long time now, People are becoming complacent about it and then they are losing their self-government and they don't even know it. Self-government is created on the back of the individual. So how do we get a self-governing nation? I usually talk about self-government ripples when I'm trying to explain how we have a self-governing nation or even if we want to think bigger than that, is it possible to have a self-governing world? Well, it could be if the nations all held up the idea of self-government in the real way, meaning that the individual was truly in charge of their own decisions. Now this channel is called Teaching Self-Government. And really it's about parents teaching their children self-government and teaching self-government principles and skills to themselves. So what is the definition of self-government? Self-government is being able to determine the cause and effect of any given situation and possessing a knowledge of your own behaviors so that you can control them. So that means that a person understands cause and effect as it relates to themselves and their own behaviors. They chart a course for themselves and then they try to stay in alignment in that course. And if they find themselves going off course, they take personal responsibility for that and they see what they need to do, make a plan to get back on course. The same thing applies for a nation or maybe a church group or maybe a business or maybe a town or city or county. The county or the city would say, where's our course? What principles do we need to follow to maintain that course? And then when it goes off course, they take personal responsibility. They say, we've done wrong. We've got to fix this and get back on course with our principles. It takes courage, honesty, bravery, integrity, in order to be a person or a nation or a state that has self-government. Also, persistence, trust in the other people around you, which means that you're not gonna force and control all of those other people around you as well. The self-government ripples that I usually teach are based upon that understanding of what self-government is. So it goes like this. If I am self-governing, that's the inside ripple, right? The very first drop in the water. If I am self-governing, which means that I make choices that are choices that hold on strong to my morals, 
principles, beliefs, foundation. Then that will impact the next ripple out, which is my family. So if I'm self-governing, self the next ripple out, so if we draw a circle around that inner circle, that will be my family. They will be more self-governing just because I'm in them. If I can be calm, guess what happens to my children? They learn calmness. It ripples out even with little things like calmness. Then if my family is self-governing, what happens to my community or my friend group, which would be the next ripple out, they become more self-governing as well. If my com community and friend group becomes more self-governing, let's say they take more of an active role in government, or let's say they choose to be more understanding and communicative in their interrelationships with their neighbors and people around them, what will happen to the next layer of self-government, which is the church's layer? Then comes the government layer, which has multiple layers within itself, because there would be the city government, this county government, the state government, the federal government, and then could come international governments if we ever thought we could get to that level. But right now we are not. I consult at the United Nations. I have consultative status there. And what I see is chaos. There is nothing there that is going to be able to help govern an entire world culture that has to go back to the nation states. But anyway, those self-government ripples, that's how self-government ripples out to the rest of the world. And it is possible if we put the focus back on the individual. So why do we elect people for office then? Why should we even care about voting if it's all about the individual? Well, because it's our choice. We get to make a choice for who represents us. That's really important because we don't have time to read every single bill and piece of legislation to talk with all the different stakeholders and people and entities who are making all of the decisions. We've got to task that to a few people to do some of that work for us so that we can govern ourselves, our families, our businesses, our communities, our churches. That way, if the government people are selected carefully by people who believe the same as them, then we can hopefully trust, fingers crossed, right? We can hopefully trust that those people will go and govern our states, cities, counties, and nations like we are governing our churches, families, friend relationships, and communities and how we are governing ourselves. So ultimately, what are we looking for when we elect someone to office? We're looking for a person of good character, a person who usually shares our foundational beliefs, our morals, our virtues and values. For me, that's a person who is honest, who is not afraid of disappointing some people sometimes, who's persistent in persevering with the truth, who honors the truth, who feels that there is someone higher than themselves that they are accountable to, and that there are other people around them that they are accountable to as well. The list could go on, but I hope you understand how self-government and the United States Constitution on who we elect and how we engage in our government actually hook together. Because without a self-governing people, which is what I'm all about. And this whole channel is all about. We lose our self-government as a nation. We have to keep being deliberate in our choices. We have to understand the principles of that constitution. Otherwise, we will lose our very choices and our very voice that we have to protect the freedoms that we hold so dear. If you haven't engaged previously, I hope that you will go on your county website, your state website, and find out who are your representatives, who are your senators, who are your county representatives and your city representatives. Reach out to one of them. Let them know that you're paying attention and start not just listening to what the news says because there's bias there, but start actually talking to the people who read through all the stuff and see if you can help them sort it out. 
they probably need your voice. So go find them. And if you've listened to the very end of this video, there is a free gift that I have for you. That is a gift of calmness. So below this video in the description, there's a calm parenting toolkit that you can click on and you can have a 10 lesson toolkit for calmness for free. I teach about calmness and behaviors most of the time, but anybody can use calmness, especially in this strange political climate that we have right now where people are just so emotional. Click on the link below that says teachselfgov.com toolkit and have that calm parenting toolkit for free today.